what his plans are, to what his word says. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Make this your response to whatever he said. From the healing of your body Amen. to the raising of the dead. Amen. No matter how you're feeling Amen. or how your world is reeling, Amen. battle on through the night. Amen. Cause you're gonna win the fight. Amen. Even in the valley. Amen. Or standing at your Red Sea. Amen. Continue to say. Amen. Cause you're helping. Let the church say, oh, 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 lift your hands wherever you are and let the church Oh, 
up on God Cause he won't give up on you He's able How many believe it tonight? Yeah, yeah He's able Thank you Jesus Come on y'all, I need y'all to help me sing God God is able to do just what he said
Yes, he is. Put it in your spirit. Let's release it in the atmosphere. Everybody to Jesus. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor and power, everybody. Unto the Lord our God. That's it. They get a song for your heart to sing. For the Lord our God. Yes, the Lord our God. Say the Lord our God. He is wonderful. Where the altos? Come on, altos. All praises. To the King of Kings. Yes. And the Lord our God. Very wonderful. We're the soprano singers. Come on, just sing to the Lord. Hallelujah. Tennis, come on, with the voice of victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. salvation and glory, salvation and glory. Honor, and power. honor and power, he is wonderful, he is everybody, everybody, come on, come on, tonight, make it glorious, make it glorious. pretty good. I went back in my mind in the late 50s. Some of y'all weren't born then. I had a radio program on Sunday night about 15, 20 minutes. And I used to try to sing a song that was entitled Wonderful. God is so wonderful. Oh, praise his holy name. He's so wonderful. That awful there is kind of piggybacking on the goodness of the Lord. Let me, before I forget it, to say happy birthday to two or three or four or five of my members. Mel V called me today to make sure that I remembered hers. And she told me about some more. She's had a birthday in March. Let me uh, 
say to us, happy birthday to each of you. And also, uh, I, I believe it was the last week, I had an anniversary. Sister Orange and I would have been together ooh, 60 some plus years. I'm not sure how many. March 21. And boy, the snow was real deep back in them times. But thank the Lord for it. Amen. I'm so proud today to, to give God all of the praises and honor, for he is a good and a wonderful God. Thank you. Brother Dempsey, let me ask today, instead of you, Xavier, I see him on here to get a scripture ready. John, you get ready for a prayer, and Brother Dempsey, Brother Stan is going to give us another selection. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> A change, a change has come over me.
those of you that love the Lord ought to say amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that a change has come over me. The Lord changed my life completely. And I'm so happy that he changed me. Amen. And if you've been converted and know that you are a child of the king, uh, a change has happened in your life also. Amen. Brother Xavier, do you have a scripture ready for us, son? If so, would you read that scripture for us now? All right. Dip, do you have some on the backup? I don't see, see Xavier on there. I got some, Pastor. All right. You're muted. Okay, Deb. Okay. Psalm 37, beginning at the 23rd verse. The step of the good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted Hallelujah. in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholded him in his hand with his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet have I not seen the Russian forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lenient, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dread forevermore. For the Lord I love it, judgment, and forsaken not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit, inherit the land and grow therein forever. The mouth of the righteousness speaketh with him, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. I read Psalm 37, 23 to 31. And the Lord has special place to the reading of his read word. Amen. Brother John? Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Let us bow. Precious Father, we come thanking you once again for our last night rest and our early rising this morning. Father God, we thank you for keeping us all day long safely and once again <laughs> allowed us to come for the study of your word. Father God, we ask that you would bless each and every one of us individually as well as collectively. Father God, yes. touch our families, Father God. Touch our children, yeah. Father God. Keep your arms of protection around us. Touch those that are bereaved today, Lord. Yes. Touch those that are <clears throat> in need of finances, Father God. We thank you right now. Father God, touch those ailments, Father God, for we know that you're a healer and you have more healing in the hem of your garment than all the drugstores in town. Father God, we just thank you right now. Thank we you thank Lord. you that we're all well. Father God, we ask that you bless our pastor today. Father God, continue to minister to him, to keep him, to embellish him with your love and right now lift him up, Father God, and let him expound on your words in such that we would get an understanding to take with us that we could utilize to bring others to you, Father God. We just thank you right now. Thank we ask Lord. that you would bless those in the government. Bless our president today, Father God. Teach, give him wisdom and knowledge to run this country, not the way he want to do it, but the way that you'd have him do it, Father God. Also, those senators, Father God, touch their hearts. Make those hearts of stone, hearts of flesh, Father God. Right now, we thank you. We ask that you would bless every church today that's open in your name, Father God. Yes, Lord. We just give you all the praise. If we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't praise you enough. But most of all, Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus who hung, bled, died for not one sin that he done, but for the sins of a sin-sick world. And yes. it's in his name 
that I pray today yeah. in the name of our Father, Jesus. Jesus. I pray. Amen. 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 All of the people of God say amen. We have today another powerful, mind-boggling, provoking topic. Prophets, a prophet of courage. This particular prophet of courage that we have today, uh, if you would, uh, you could begin really at chapter 17, 16, if you wish, and go all the way to chapter 22 as to how this prophet showed courage uh, of the Lord and his dealing with the people of God. And I've come to the conclusion that if one wants to be a prophet, a proclaimer for the Lord God Almighty, you must have courage to stand and somehow learn how to tell the truth. There are too many persons who proclaim to be prophets uh, who are not telling the truth about the matter. And we are causing some people to, uh, to error. I am going to ask though, for those of you that will, uh, read chapter 17 of First King. And I want to begin later on at verse one of chapters 18. The lesson itself picks up at verses five of chapter 18. Just let me read now verses one, then I'm gonna flip over through five. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came unto Elijah in the third year said, Go show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a so famine in Samaria. And Ahab called over there, which was the governor of his house. Now over there, feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel of the prophet that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them bread and water, which he uh, almost jeopardized, should have, could have jeopardized his own life for doing so. Now back in seven, you will see where this prophet have the courage to go in and tell Obadiah, or tell Ahab, according to my words, the Lord told me to tell you, there won't be no rain, nor dew, for the space of three years, and really three years and six months. For some of the most courageous individuals, anyone, could ever encounter was the prophet of the Old Testament. He, here he is Elijah man who was used in today's lesson. Here is Elijah man who was used by God to confront one of Israel's most wicked king and his ruthless, dogmatic a uh, wife by the name of Jezebel. I don't know if I ever heard anybody named Jezebel. We are allude to folk as Jezebel, but I don't know if I remember uh, nobody named being told Jezebel. She was a tough sister. <laughs> so thank you by the girls don't even like you to allude to them as she is a Jezebel. 
the king Ahab and his ruthless wife Jezebel. Uh, the time demands someone who will not back down <clears throat> in the face of braven uh, defiance of the truth of God of Israel. And Elijah was that man. He did not receive his courage from a medal, for he was a meddler, if you would allow me to use that uh, for God. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I said to us, yo, give me 15 or 20 cents for me to meddle in your business. <laughs> try, try to help you to get it together. Today's scripture covers the early portion of the ministry of the prophet Elijah, who prophesied some 30 plus years from 69, 8, 869 to 833. He proclaimed the word of the Lord during one of the most critical periods uh, in the Old Testament history. His ministry began after Solomon died and the kingdom was split into the north uh, tribe, the northern kingdom went to Judah, and into the southern kingdom. The first king of the northern tribe was Jeroboam. Uh, he was one of the uh, servants of King Solomon. So he, he had the first, the, the most went to him. He set up uh, two golden calves. He violated Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 4, where the Lord says, Thou shalt have no other God before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So he violated those two by setting up uh, golden calves, and he did it in two different ways. He did it both in the north of the Dan, and he did it in the southern part of Bethel. This made it easier for the people to embrace, if you would, uh, pagan worship. The reign of King Ahab in the northern Israel in about eight 74, he lasted for about 31 years, was characterized by ec economy, prosperity, and at least at the outset. It was also a time of spiritual poverty. Idol worship became more prevalent when Ahab married this sister named Jezebel who was a worshiper of the god Baal. Baal to them was believed to have been a god of futility. Uh, everything that had like plants, animals, persons that believed that Baal was god of fertility and he gave life. He boldly proclaimed, that is, Elijah did boldly proclaim that there would be no dew, no rain. And you picked it up again in James 5 17 for a period of time. A declaration of famine amounted to a grave insult to Baal and to Abraham and to Jezebel and constituted, if you would, a direct challenge to the authority of this fictitious God. Follow this announcement of family, Elijah went into hiding in his back seven and 17. The prophet hid by the brook Kidron until the brook dried up. Then he traveled to Zeph Zephanites of Zidon. This is where uh, Jezebel homeland was in uh, this particular, particular place. Um, they stay with the widow 
whom he offered two unforgettable demonstrations of God's power. When you read this in chapters 18, going to 19, you will see where Elijah leave and go there and he see this with a woman when the brook dried up. He goes and he see this woman uh, with a woman gathering sticks. The book will say two sticks. And she was about to eat her last. She said a morsel of bread and a little cruise of oil. And she did something that most of us would not have done. She said she was going to eat this last hope cake, a little pancake. And then she and her son were going to die. When Elijah first showed up, he said to her, water was a scarcity. Fetch me, I said, a little water. And she went to get him some water. And he said, and while you're going, bring me back a little bread. And then she explains to him that she will have this handful of meal that she was about to cook so she and her son could die. And he said, he is worried on it. And he said, bring me one first. I'd taken a lot of courage. This woman brought the preacher a morsel of pancake, of your wood, a biscuit first, a pancake like I used to make, a whole cake like I made. And every time that she would shake the barrel, there was enough food for she, her son, and Elijah. And the book says they ate there for many days. He promised also about her son. Her son, you, as you read further on in chapter 18, he gets sick and dies, and his widow says to her, him, um, what have I done? And he goes and stretch himself out over the, the child and brings him back and gives him back to his mother again. Now, I read verses one through four, and our lesson will begin at verse five. And Ahab said to Obadiah, go into the land unto all fountains of the water, and to all brooks, three events, or perhaps we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive that we lose not all of the beasts. The name Obadiah is used of some 12 different men in the Old Testament, in addition to the book and the mighty prophets who bear the name of Obadiah. This particular man is the first mention in the, in the biblical record in 1 King 18.3, where he is described as a governor uh, which meant that Obadiah was in charge of Ahab's palace, or perhaps in Samaria, and he had an official position. Obadiah was a man of remarkable courage, embrace. He is described as someone who feared the Lord. When I read it earlier, and you probably didn't even hear me. He said he feared the Lord, and when Jezebel started killing off the prophets, he hid a hundred of the prophets of Baal, of the prophets of, of the Lord, and taking a chance during the scarcity of food and water. He fed them bread and water. He risked his life. Perhaps he was an uh, overdive warden. It was kind of like another man that I know who was more concerned about uh, himself and the economy uh, than he was the people. And uh, he was preoccupied also with keeping his army supplies with the animal necessary for the military preparedness. This situation in the kingdom had become so desperate that the king and one of his chief officials, not the usual worker, was asked for the task of finding something, food and water for the animal. Uh, Obadiah, so he desired the land between them to pass through it 
Ahab went one way, and Obadiah went another way. Ahab realized sometimes you got to come to that point. How difficult it would be for one man to cover the extent of the territory. So he proceeds to divide the northern kingdom between the two of them. The hope was that he would find enough grazing land that he could keep his horses and his mules and perhaps the livestock alive. And I don't know how far they were apart, but as Obadiah was on his way after they depart, Elisha appeared. Elisha met him and Obadiah knew him. And he fell to his face and said, Art thou my Lord Elisha? Elijah probably would have been traveling south from Zidon, where the prophet had been helping the widow of Zarephath in 1718. It is likely that Obadiah was traveling through the northern part of Israel when the two men met. Obadiah's question reflects some measures of doubt that this was really Elijah. They had been looking for Elijah. Everywhere they go, they could never find him. But here, he is all of a sudden, he appears. Uh, disbelief that he was seeing Elijah at, at all. Uh, addressing Elijah as my Lord reflects the reverence, fear of which Obadiah held the prophet of God's message. Uh, and uh, Elijah answered and said, I am. He wouldn't deny himself. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now, all the time before this, when every time they'd go, they had searched and searched and searched, and they couldn't find Elijah nowhere. But Elijah confirmed that he himself was speaking to Obadiah as a part of a command to return to Ahab this wicked king. Although Ahab, although Obadiah had called Elijah Lord, Elijah implied that Obadiah had actually been honoring and serving the king Ahab. This may have been a subtle dig or an outright test for Obadiah. And he said, Obadiah said, what have I sinned? that you would deliver your servant to the hands of, of, of Ahab. And otherwise he was afraid that if Ahab if he don't, if he don't, if Elijah don't show, uh, Ahab gonna kill him. He had done it before. So, but I assume that if Elijah was asking him to put his life in such a jeopardy, it must be to be a punish for him him for a particular sin he had committed. That's an Obadiah in, uh, in, in 1812. 1812 said, and it shall come pass as soon as I'm gone from thee that the spirit of the Lord shall carry thee where thou know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he should not find me, he should kill me or slay me. But your servants fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord from his youth. And that's what he wanted them to understand. As the Lord, as the, as the Lord thou God liveth, there is no kingdom or nation where the Ahab has not been looking, seeking thee. And when they said it, he is, had took an oath of that kingdom and nation that they would find him. In contrast to the problem, who feared the task would leave him dead. The Lord liveth, which is a statement that is often used, that promised over that, that Elisha wore to be made, Elijah were made before God. This marks 
of the fact that both men are true prophets. They serve the living God, not idols or fictitious, pious gods. We need to assume, we need not to assume that there was literally no nation or kingdom that Ahab had not questioned about Elijah's whereabouts. Brother Obadiah is kind of exaggerating here about when he says what he has done. Uh, in, 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 in 1 Kings 17, 9, talks about the fact that there had then have they had they been, they would have risked Ahab's wrath by lying on the oath, and you didn't lie to a king and live. If you found the lying to him, that would be the end of that for you. Over that may have been exaggerating when he told Elijah that Ahab had sent out such to every nation, but it tells us that Ahab such for Elijah was a one that he had searched and searched and searched, and he had not been able to find him. 12, 11 and 12. And now, Thou or you said, go tell your servant, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it should come to pass as soon as I'm gone from, from you, that the spirit of the Lord will carry you whether I know not. And so when I come and tell him, Ahab, and he can't find you, man, he gonna kill me. If Ahab heard from over there, and he had met Elijah without arresting him, the king would have been infuriated. The implication of not immediately bringing Elijah to Ahab would be that Obadiah was lying to the king, something that you did not do and live. This phrase, and it shall come to pass, indicate that Obadiah is considerate what he had to say next to have been foregone conclusion. In his own estimate, Obadiah would pay for his life. Spirit of God would take Elijah away. We all think of the spirit working in a prophet's life in terms of the speech. However, Obadiah was more concerned with the spirit ability to move or to hide a person supernaturally as he had done with Enoch. And that's in, in Genesis 5, 24. And you see what Enoch walked and talked with God. And one day he was not found. He went home to live with uh, the Lord. Uh, oh, and I knew something of how prophets of the Lord operated in obedience to him. Though Elijah intended to appear before him, it would only happen if God allowed it. In fact, God had commanded it back in verses one and two. You told him to go and show yourself. I just read it, and it come to pass after many days that the word came to Elijah in the third year said, go show yourself to Abraham, and I will send rain up on the earth. Amen. So when he get here with these here and here, God the Lord had told him that he promised to do that. But I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. This is what I said. Was it not told you back here what he said back in, in the beginning in verse three? How I feared when Ju and when Jezebel was killing the prophets, how I feared a hundred prophets broke them down in the fifties to two different places. And I said them in case I risked my life with the, with the with the severity of water and the scarcity of food. I uh, gave them bread and water and fed them uh, in the cave. Over that began a defense 
for his personal character and devotion to the Lord as a, as a reason why his life should not be put in danger. He had lived up to the meaning of his name, a servant of the Lord. In fact, he had grown up from his youth fearing God, which is a sign of wisdom. And you see that in Proverbs 1 7. Proverbs 1 7 said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you have enough sense, but fools despise wisdom and understand, if you got enough sense to fear the Lord, uh, you're in good shape. But a lot of folks don't have enough sense to fear God. So you got to learn how to fear God. As you fear God, God will take care of you. Amen. I'm a witness. Not only did he have a very good, a sneaky large amount of bread and water, but the chance to discover was heightening during the time of the drought and the famine put in verse 14. And now you saying, go tell my Lord the whole Elijah is here. Man, don't you know he'll kill me? So Obadiah is repeating again what he had already said once before the danger of Elijah was putting him in. And Elijah said to him, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. Many times before, he would never, Elijah, he, Ahab could not find, but I'm going to show him today. Elijah's first recorded prophecy that neither doom nor rain would fall on Israel opened with a similar oath in First King 17. The oath at hand was trustworthy as any promise could ever be. In Elijah's uh, expand on Owenai's oath in 18.10. Not only does God live, but he is the Lord of hosts. This is the warrior's image of God, leaving the heavenly angels in the barrel and battle against evil. The title Obadiah attends to God's power, not just his presence. In addition, uh, the word before whom I stand is closely related to, to what the Lord God had, Almighty has said in Jeremiah. As the Lord's spokesman, Elijah stood ready to go speak and to do whatever the Lord had commanded him to do. Elisha meets over there and antagonizes the reception. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Elijah's words and oath satisfied Obadiah and settling in doubt he may have had about the outcome without Elijah. This was the first time in three and a half years that uh, they had met when he, in chapter 17, when he tells him what the Lord says, he walks out and he had not seen him in three plus years. And every time he tried to look for him, he was gone. And it came to pass when Abedash saw a Elisha that Ahab tried to switch the, the situation around and asked him, are you he that troubled Israel? No, 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 no. This phase came to pass, uh, echoes of uh, Obadiah's previous phase, fear and shows how to have been seen. Ahab's greeting of seeing Elisha was just the opposite uh, what Obadiah had thought. Uh, he thought that he would 
if he didn't see him, he was going to get killed. But he was just opposite that. This. But in a sense, Ahab was right. Any prophet of the Lord, hallelujah, will trouble the people when he confront them with the truth about God's faithful needs to repent. Folk don't like for you to tell them that if you don't do thus and so, I was just listening to a guy today, I was at the doctor's office, not that far with the doctor's office, he told another man. And he said, every time my preacher talk to me, he tell me I'm going to hell. Folk don't like for you to tell them that. Apparently, his ways is so contrary to the man just trying to tell him, unless you get your act together. Oh, yes. And you know who don't have your act together, Mel V? You know it before anybody else that you don't have your act together. You know that. Now, you would try to pretend as though you don't know it. You try to. I told y'all about this boy that uh, who said he was a Christian, didn't have no church, didn't go to church, didn't have no pastor, but he's a Christian. I don't understand that. Uh, if you are a Christian, you know that uh, you need to be a church. If you're a Christian, you know you need to be a pastor. And uh, now, if you don't go to church, that means you ain't doing nothing. So you're playing with yourself, about yourself. Uh, with the Lord. And uh, he answered, oh, what I answer? I mean, Ahab answered. I'm going to get it right now. Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Baalism. Back in the books of Exodus, you see where uh, the people who were following Baal, and this man was on the mule. The mule saw the angel with the sword. The man that was on the mule was on his way to curse Israel. And the, the mule had more sense than the man. He ducked him and hit him upside the head. But Elijah did not back down in the face of the king's anger. He threw Ahab accusation back at him, letting him know that the king and his adulterous father's house were the real troublemakers for Israel. The famine had come upon the land because of adulterous practice. I read that last week when the king went so far as even to offer his own, his own son. These particulars, these practices were furthered through Abraham's effort in promoting the worship of Baal back in 1630 with the enthusiastic support of his wife Jezebel in, in, in Second King. And first and second, second King 21. First King 21. You see, in first King 21, uh, after uh, we we'll go back to 20, really, after uh, Ahab see this plot of land that he won't right beside his, it was owned by a man by the name of Ordias. And uh, he want he wanted to land, I mean Nahum, he wanted to Nabot, he wanted to land. And Nabal told me he couldn't sell it because it was a prophet, part of his prophet from his daddy. And he went home, stressed out on the bed, and his wife came in and wanted to know what was wrong with him. He tells her the story about Nabot won't sell him the land that he wanted to use for uh, to make him another God spot. He said, don't, don't worry about it. She wrote a letter and had Nabot killed. And Ahab got his land, but the prophet preacher told him where the dogs licked Naboth's blood, they going to lick your blood up. And as for this sister Jezebel, they going to eat her up. 
Amen. So when she fell off the wall, laid her up on the thing was left, they found a palm of her hand and top of her skull. The rest of her were eaten up by the dough. English usually formed the plural by adding S to an ending of a particular statement. However, the Hebrew formed the plural by adding I am. Hence, Baalism is in the plural of Baal. Occurs about 18 times in the Old Testament. The word means Lord or possessors. And the plural may reference may reference to the different manifestation of the so-called God. Not long before Abraham and Elijah meet both the king and the people. So it glared the uh, demonstrating of the impotence of the adultery that the power of Elijah's God. 18, chapter 18. By verse 21, after they meet. Well, verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel together, the prophet together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long caught you between two opinions? If God be God, you ought to serve him. And if Baal, serve him. And the people did him like y'all do me sometime. They wouldn't say a word. <laughs> so Elijah knew who he was. But he needed proof of them who they were. 450 and then another 400. Tell you what I want y'all to do. We're going to try and let us find out who God really is, chapter 18. We're going to build an altar, take two bucks. We're going to kill them up, kill them and dress them. And the God that will answer by fire, let him be God. And people said, that sounds like a good idea. So the 400, 450 are prophets. Of Baal, they built the altar, they cut it up of the meat, they laid it on the altar. But Elijah said to them now, it's going to only be the God that answers by fire. They called on the Lord and nothing happened. So Elijah decided that he's going to kind of play with them a little bit. Y'all maybe need to call him a little bit louder. Maybe he's gone, or maybe he's going to sleep. And they begin to jump up on themselves and holler and pray and cut themselves. And finally, Elijah says, all right, you've had your time. Tear this stuff down. Tore it down, built him an altar. After he built an altar, he laid the meat on the altar. And what's going to hear said, the God of answer by fire. Lay the meat on the altar. Take what I want us to do. Dig a big trench. Around the altar, go get me four barrels of water, pour it on the meat and around the altar. Go back and get me four more barrels, pour it on the altar. Go back and get me four more barrels, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel, and pour it on the altar. And he called on the name of the Lord. And the Lord set down fire, sat the water up. Got the burnt offering. And with the for sure that Ahab, God was a fictitious God, but Elisha's God was a mighty God. And Elisha left from there. When you read this, they kind of scare you. Read this, he answered by fire. And he go and, and Jezebel tells him what she's going to do. He leaves from there and go and hide himself momentarily. And he tells his servant, God had promised him that he was going to answer by rain. Go look. 
and tell me what you see. Man came back and said, I don't see nothing. He said, go look until seven times and then tell me what you see. He went and finally came back and said, he said to him, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And it clouded up, got dark, and it rained. And when you read the book of James, he said that Elijah was a man like us, but he feared God. And because he feared God, he called on the name of God, and God sent rain. Amen to prove that he was the God that he said he was. Courage has always been the trademark of God's spokesman. It happened in the book of Joshua. It happened in the book of Amos. Like Elijah, these prophets continue to proclaim courageously the lead faithfulness according to the Lord's word. Like Elijah, these prophets were considered to be troublemakers. And even today, if you proclaim the word of God and tell folk about thus said the Lord, you are a troublemaker to them. And don't you don't be surprised if sometimes they won't even try to destroy your life. For telling them to, but you're going to have to be courageous enough to tell them what thus says the Lord. The Lord had promised he'd be with you, but you got to be courageous enough to tell, as I said earlier, to tell the truth. And if you will tell the truth, the truth is the only thing that will set you. Thank you. God bless you. Heaven. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering. Sometimes I tell you something else I find out about truth. The truth will hurt you. It'll help you, but it will hurt you sometimes. And until you have learned to accept the truth of God, you shall never. I really should that you will never be helped. Let us remember, let us repeat the mission there. I'm persuaded by the teaching of the Blessed Bible, by daily reading, meditation, and communion with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to live an upright Christian life, to practice his teaching in my dealing with my fellow man, to dedicate my time and give up my titles, influence and means to teach and spreading the Christian religion at home and abroad, to win souls through personal service for Christ and to encourage and help a young people in the enlistment of Christian work. And if you learn how to do that, then you say, to these ends I pledge to devote myself and seek divine aid daily that I may become a living witness and a bright and shining light for my Lord. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And those of you that love the Lord need to say, Amen. 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 God bless us. It was my one hope today that I helped somebody. I'm going to try yeah. to tell you this. You really need to go back. Okay, sweet. And you really need to start reading at 16, but I'm not going to ask you to read 16. Just read chapter 17 and 18, and you'll get the gist of what I was trying to say to you uh, today. Bless us. Help me. Bless me, the ties, the ties that bind our hearts 
in Christian love, the fellowship of kin is mine, is like to that above. But standing there, I'll be looking to see her Saturday about 9, 9.30 for those will. And let me ask those of you that can and will to please send your gifts. Remember, 1 Corinthians 16, where it says, now concerning the collection of the saints upon the first day of the week, that every one of us lay aside and stew as God has promised. Then I will tithe an offering to the New Inspiration Baptist Church Post Office Box. Uh, 3702 Shreveport, Louisiana, 71133. God bless us. Have a smile upon us. Thank you again, Brother Stanley, for orchestrating being so kind. Bless us. Have a smile upon us. God be with you. Till we meet again. You read that, you find. I know, I know you hadn't quite read all that, but just read some of it. You'll find what I'm trying to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. Some good stuff. Bless you. Thank you. Thank Bless you, Pastor. You. Bless you. you. Who said that? Gay. Okay. All right. Thank you, baby. Shuck it. All right. Bless good us. Lesson. Bless us. Bless good us. Lesson. Huh? I said, good lesson. I read that stuff. It was good. I learned some stuff. But did you did you go back to chapter 17 and read all the 18? Yes, I went back to 16 and went all the way up. Yeah, I did. All right, all right. Then you jumped yeah. on it right then. Bless you. Bless I you. Learned some all right. Good stuff. So yes, you kind of understood a little bit what I said. Yes, sir. About about Nabot and Jezebel and they have and all that good stuff. Bless us. Thank you. Uh, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody didn't read that game. I'm just trying to encourage <laughs> them to read it. Well, if they <laughs> read it, they'll learn some good stuff. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. All right. Thank you so kindly. Bless us. Thank you.